This Dell Optiplex might not seem like much, but in one of my previous videos, we saw that that isn't the case. This somewhat boring office PC is actually pretty rare because it has a first-gen Ryzen Pro CPU. That CPU only has four cores and four threads, but this motherboard has an AM4 socket. Let the upgrades begin. Let the upgrades begin. Let the upgrades begin. <laughs> That's stupid. Upgrading a PC like this is a lot of fun, but another great thing to upgrade is your workspace with something like the Revodoc Max 213 from today's sponsor, Ugreen. The 13-port Revodoc Max is a beast and has connectivity for pretty much any workflow. It features two 40 gigabit per second Thunderbolt 4 ports, supporting high-resolution displays, crazy fast SSDs, or other Thunderbolt devices like my audio interface, for example. With the built-in DisplayPort and Thunderbolt ports, you can drive up to two 4K60 displays or a single 8K 30Hz display. With a variety of 10 and 5 gigabit per second Type-C and Type-A ports, you'll have no issues connecting all of your accessories and peripherals. Also, the USB-C port on the front provides up to 20 watts of USB power delivery, so you can charge your phone, tablet, or any other USB power delivery device. Thanks to the included 180 watt power supply, you also get 90 watts of charging for the host system through the upstream Thunderbolt 4 port. This means you can keep your laptop charged and connected to all your devices with just one cable, keeping your whole setup nice and tidy. With the Revodoc Max 213, you also get other really helpful features like 2.5 gigabit networking, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and independent SD and TF 4.0 card readers. Even with all of these ports, the Revodoc Max stays nice and cool thanks to its pleated aluminum design and built-in cooling silicone gel. The Revodoc Max will probably work with your device, as it's compatible with most Macs, Windows PCs, and even some tablets that have Thunderbolt or USB-C ports. If you're looking to organize and upgrade your setup, make sure to check out the Revodoc Max 213 from Ugreen by clicking the links down in the description below. This is the Dell Optiplex 5055, and if you missed my last video, you can check that out here. I paid $65 for this system, and it's a pretty modest little PC. It has 8GB of DDR4, a 256GB SATA SSD, an R5 430 GPU, and as I mentioned earlier, a first-gen Ryzen Pro CPU, the Ryzen 3 Pro 1300. Overall, the system performed pretty well, but I wanted to see just how much we could get out of this little small form factor desktop. So in this video, I'm pretty much going to try to max out this thing and see how well it performs as a desktop, budget workstation, and even a home server. Now, as I hinted in the last video and the intro of this one, this obviously has an AM4 socket and there are a lot of really good value AM4 CPUs out there. But that doesn't mean I can just toss in a 5000 series Ryzen CPU and be on my way. That might be possible with a third party motherboard, but with these OEM systems, it's not always that easy. It's pretty typical on a system like this Dell Optiplex for the BIOS to only have microcode for a specific range of CPUs. This specific Optiplex 5055 only came with three CPU options, the Ryzen Pro 1300, Pro 1500, and Pro 1700. After not seeing much success on forums with people upgrading to newer generations with these Dell Optiplexes, I decided to just stick within the same first generation. It is possible that something like the Ryzen 7 1800X would work, but for me, the bump in clock speed wasn't quite worth the extra money, heat, and risk that this system might not even post. So I picked up an AMD Ryzen 7 1700 for about $65 on eBay with shipping. This CPU has 8 cores, 16 threads, a base clock of 3 GHz, and a boost clock of 3.7 GHz. It's definitely possible to get higher clock speeds with overclocking, but I don't think we're going to be doing a lot of overclocking in this little Dell Optiplex. Also, fun fact, the Ryzen 7 1700 is actually the first and only new CPU I've ever bought. This system originally only came with 8GB of RAM, and obviously I wanted to upgrade that. Rather than buying anything, I used this 4x8GB kit of Team Group 3600 mega transfers per second DDR4 for a total of 32GB. Rather than using the SATA SSD as a boot drive, I opted to use the available M.2 socket with a 1TB NVMe SSD. The Radeon R5 430 didn't perform terribly in the last video, but it was definitely a bottleneck when doing any gaming and such. Also, the fan was broken and was getting really annoying. Because the Bi-16 PCIe slot was at the bottom of the case, I was limited to half-height single-slot GPU options. 
I could have gone with something like the RX 6400, but I wanted to get something with a bit more performance that I could also use in future videos, so I landed on this NVIDIA RTX T1000. The T1000 is essentially a Quadro card before NVIDIA killed off the Quadro branding. There is an 8GB version of this card, but I decided for the 4GB version because it was quite a bit cheaper. Now there was one pretty substantial issue when this card arrived, which was that this little capacitor up here actually broke off inside the packaging. One amateur soldering job later, and it was as good as new. At least I hope. Right above the by 16 PCIe slot is a by 4 PCIe Gen 2 slot, and obviously I just couldn't leave that empty. So I grabbed a used Dell Intel X540-T2 dual 10 gigabit RJ45 NIC for around $30 on eBay. Rather than upgrading everything at once, I decided it would be smart to introduce each component one at a time. There's always some weird chance for incompatibility with an OEM system like this, and I was also just slightly worried we might push our 240 watt power supply just a little bit too far. I started off by dropping in the Ryzen 7 1700, and you actually might have noticed an issue. Earlier I mentioned that the Dell Optiplex 5055 small form factor technically supports three CPUs, the Ryzen Pro 1300, Pro 1500, and Pro 1700, and I bought just a plain old Ryzen 7 1700, and I didn't realize my mistake until it had already arrived in the mail. I dropped it in anyway just hoping that this motherboard would have support for all first gen Ryzen CPUs, but when I first tried to turn it on, the system wouldn't post. I didn't completely give up hope though, and dropped the old CPU back in to check and see if there was a BIOS update available. And it turns out I was on BIOS version 1.7 and there was a 1.10 available. After updating the BIOS and dropping the 1700 back in, it actually posted. I'm not sure if it was the BIOS update that fixed it or if I just reseeded the CPU, but either way, I was glad, because when I tried to find listings of the Ryzen Pro 1700, it seems to be just about as rare as the Ryzen Pro 1300 was. And there's actually some more good news. Once I got into Windows and was sitting at idle, the system actually drew about 3 watts less from the wall, sitting at around 33 watts idle. With the CPU working, I dropped in the four 8GB sticks of DDR4. The system was very kind and let me know that I changed the RAM, and then booted into Windows without any issue. Well, mostly without any issues. The old 8GB kit of DDR4 was rated for 2400 mega transfers per second. This new kit was technically rated for 3600, but because the BIOS doesn't have any sort of memory settings or ways to activate XMP profiles, the system just defaulted to 2133 megatransfers per second. This wouldn't be that big of an issue if we were working with an Intel CPU, but with Ryzen, especially first gen Ryzen, memory speed can be a pretty big deal. Memory clock speeds directly affect the performance of the Infinity fabric, which connects the CCDs and the CPU. Long story short, faster memory is really good for first gen Ryzen. The only DDR4-2400 kit I had was this 2x8 kit, which would be half the capacity, but the slightly faster RAM speed might be worth it, so I decided to try out both. The T1000 dropped in without any issue, and that actually brought the idle power down to just 30 watts. I wasn't really expecting the power drop to come down by so much, but I guess with a lower clocked CPU and a newer GPU, it kind of makes sense. With a fresh install of Windows and all the correct drivers, I started out with a few benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R23. In the multi-threaded test, the Optiplex 5055 achieved a score of 7978. Upgrading to the DDR4-2400 kit didn't make much of an improvement, as it only scored an 8047, which was less than a 1% improvement. When compared to the original version with the 4-core Pro 1300, we see over double the performance in the multi-threaded workload. In the single-threaded test, the RAM made a more noticeable improvement. The original upgraded 5055 scored an 849, and then a 907 with a slightly faster RAM. That's about a 6% improvement. The original configuration with the Ryzen Pro 1300 scored a 925. This isn't really that surprising though. Even though the Pro 1300 only has 4 cores and 4 threads, it has a substantially higher base clock. In the older Cinebench R15 multi-threaded test, we see very similar margins. The two Ryzen 1700 configurations were once again within 1% of each other at 1388 and 1399, and the older configuration scored a 552. I also ran PC Mark 10, where the upgraded system actually performed a little bit worse in the essentials and productivity categories. This is probably due to those suites being more reliant on fewer, faster cores. In the content category though, the score was nearly doubled, most likely thanks to the 16 threads and the Nvidia T1000. I was a little bit concerned about CPU temperatures with the tiny cooler, but it managed to keep the Ryzen 7 1700 to around 71 degrees when running Cinebench for quite some time, 
You might get a little bit of thermal throttling, especially if you're running this system in a warmer space, but that's still really only if you're pushing this thing 100%. As I mentioned earlier, the system idled at around 30 watts, which was 6 watts less than the original configuration. However, while running Cinebench, it jumped up to 117 watts. Compared to the original configuration, that's a 77% increase in system power, but it's important to keep in mind that the upgraded system had almost a 140% increase in performance during that benchmark. In this comparison, the Ryzen 7 1700 looks pretty good, but it might not look quite so good when compared to some more modern offerings. I decided to pull up the results from this mini PC from Geekom with an Intel i7-1260P. This little PC outperformed the Ryzen 7 system in the Cinebench R23 multi-threaded test and absolutely demolished it in the single-threaded test. It also drew significantly less power idling at only 8 watts, and it drew around 80 watts while running Cinebench. But that was only for a short time thanks to Intel's Turbo Boost technology. Once the clock speeds dropped down, the system sat at just 42 watts for the majority of the benchmark. Now obviously this isn't a fair comparison because systems with the i7-1260P typically cost over $500 and I got this desktop and CPU for less than $150, but I still thought it was interesting to compare this system to a lot of the more modern CPUs, especially with how efficient they're getting. With the NVIDIA T1000, I felt like some gaming was now finally a realistic option for this PC. For all the gaming benchmarks, I used the slightly faster DDR4-2400 kit. In Rocket League at 1080p max settings, I was getting plenty of frames per second with fairly smooth gameplay. There was a consistent hitch in frame times though, similar to what I saw in the previous video. Dialing down the settings and or capping the frame rate to 60 actually made this more noticeable. In Counter-Strike 2 on the medium preset, I was usually seeing between 70 and 100 frames per second with very few noticeable hitches. I imagine dialing back the settings to low would provide an even more competitive experience. I gave Kingdom Come Deliverance a shot, as I remember that game being pretty CPU demanding back when I played it. However, on medium or even low settings, the GPU was clearly the limiting factor still. While I was getting well over 60 frames per second on low settings, there were some very noticeable stutters. I ended up switching to medium settings at 720p with vSync enabled, and that actually provided a pretty decent looking and very smooth experience. I also tried out Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p on the lowest balanced setting. While riding around the countryside, we were only getting around 30 to 45 frames per second, but it felt buttery smooth, and even with lower settings, it's still a great looking game. I gave PS2 emulation a shot once again, and with the 1700 and T1000 combo, I had no issues. At 3 times native render resolution, or essentially 1080p, and with blending accuracy set to high, I had no issues getting 60 frames per second in both Need for Speed Most Wanted and Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance 2. I was curious how this new Dell Optiplex might handle some video editing, since that's something I do a lot of. But before trying that out, I dropped in the dual 10 gigabit NIC. However, that didn't quite work out so well. I thought having a fan would be a good option, but it was incredibly obnoxious. But even worse, the system just didn't post. I don't know if this is an issue with it being a Dell OEM part, or if the card doesn't like to work in a by 4 slot, but I just decided to use a Marvel 10 gigabit NIC that I already have. I should apologize because all of the B-roll for this video is now wrong because I shot the B-roll before I tested the system, so just ignore that, okay? That card worked though, and I was getting file transfers at around 1 gigabyte per second or so. So I decided to pull up a project in DaVinci Resolve Studio, and somehow I managed to not record any of that, but the experience was pretty smooth and somewhat snappy, maybe not quite as good as my editing system, but it was still pretty good. You'll just have to take my word for it. I did test out an H.264 render that took around 4 minutes and 4 seconds, a little bit more than twice as long as my personal editing system, with a Ryzen 3950X and RTX 306012 GB. That's actually not that bad, all things considered, and I think this little PC could be a decent budget editing workstation. Now earlier, I said that the BIOS doesn't have any options for memory overclocking, and that's true, but while writing the script, I remembered that the Ryzen Master overclocking software exists. I decided to give that a shot, not for overclocking the CPU, but for overclocking the memory. If I tried to bump the RAM up to 32 megatransfers per second, the system wouldn't post. But at 2933, the system worked and seemed to be stable. I reran Cinebench R23, and while the multi-threaded scores were pretty much the same, the single-threaded score improved by over 9% when compared to the DDR4-2133 score. 
That's actually a pretty noticeable improvement, and I wish I would have caught it a bit sooner and maybe done some more tinkering. But since I noticed it after I did all of the filming, I decided it wasn't worth going back and redoing a lot of the benchmarks for a small increase, especially when in most of the instances where we were running single-threaded workloads, we were GPU limited. To see how this might work as a home server, primarily with virtualization, I installed Proxmox. I also added in a couple of SATA SSDs for some storage. Because there's only one SATA power connector, I used a splitter to power both drives. Now these were only 256 gigabyte SSDs, but I still thought this could give an idea of what you might be able to do with this system. If you didn't want to spend an arm and a leg, but have a good amount of capacity, you could try to find some good deals on two and a half inch hard drives. While idling in Proxmox, the entire system with the 10 gigabit NIC and SATA SSDs drew around 43 watts. I was hoping that by setting the CPU scaling governor to power save, that I might be able to drop that down a bit more, but that didn't seem to help any. I had the idea to pass through the SATA controller to a TrueNAS Core VM, but that would have involved trying to split up IOMMU groups, so I just instead passed through the individual disks to the virtual machine. This worked, except that the disk didn't have a unique serial number, which made TrueNAS pretty grumpy. After a sophisticated adjustment in the VM config, I had TrueNAS working just fine and had fairly decent 10 gigabit transfer speeds through a virtualized NIC. I also set up a virtual machine running Linux Mint, and here I wanted to take advantage of the GPU but not use PCIe pass-through so that I could still use the GPU for other containers or VMs. So I gave VirGL a shot, which essentially uses the GPU to provide a virtual GPU that has support for OpenGL. To access the desktop, I used Sunshine and Moonlight, and while it was usable, it definitely wasn't snappy. It's very likely I failed to configure things properly, and frankly, this is all getting pretty off topic. For virtualization, the Ryzen 7 1700 is pretty great with its 8 cores and 16 threads, although it doesn't necessarily sip power. I was going to set up an LXC container running Jellyfin, but then I remembered just how annoying using NVIDIA GPUs can be when it comes to getting drivers working in LXC containers and on the host and everything, so I decided to just skip all that and boot up Windows. In Windows, I installed Jellyfin without any issues and got transcoding working with tone mapping. When transcoding 10-bit 4K HEVC to 1080p with tone mapping, the T1000 was cranking out almost 140 frames per second. When transcoding 4K H.264 to 1080p, I was getting around 160 to 170 frames per second. While transcoding, the system power draw would jump up to around 90 watts, but once the source was transcoded, it would drop back down to around 48 watts while continuing to stream. That's not that bad, but still not nearly as good as a lot of the more modern Intel integrated graphics. Overall, other than some pretty high power draw at times, the system performed pretty well, but how much did I actually spend? Well, for the original system, I spent $65, and then another $66 for the Ryzen 7 1700. Now, I already had the RAM on hand, but assuming I bought it new, it would cost around $80. The same goes for the SSD, which was around $65, and if you were to buy a PCIe card with the same 10 gig NIC, that would cost you around $75. I spent $251 on the NVIDIA T1000, bringing the total to right around $600. Now for a budget system, I don't think $600 is really that great, but this isn't a buyer's guide or anything, and I didn't do a lot of deal hunting, so realistically you could buy a system very similar to this for quite a bit less if you look around for some good deals. I had a lot of fun on this one, and I hope you did as well. If you have any thoughts on what you think I could do with this system, or just other ideas for videos, make sure to put them down in the comments below. If you liked this video and want to see more, hit the like button, maybe hit subscribe, and if you want to support me, you can do that either here on YouTube or on my Patreon as a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.